I sometimes get asked how to begin with test-driven development. Where do you start? How do you learn this skill? I think it's a good question because I think test-driven development is one of the more important, valuable skills that we can learn as software developers. So, where do you begin? How should you start? How should you practice the skills and techniques to get going with test-driven development? I'm also going to introduce you to a tool that I think might be helpful along your way in learning some of these techniques. So, for this episode, how, is, how do we start with test-driven development? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus and Specflow. They're all helping us to develop our channel. So please do check out their links in the description below. In this episode, I want to explore the techniques of learning and practicing test-driven development. I'm going to do that in the context of a tool that some friends of my, uh, mine run called CyberDojo, which allows you to practice these skills without any need for setup or tool. This video would be too long if I gave if I showed you the whole exercise and so I've edited it down somewhat. If you'd like to see the whole thing you can check out uh, the links in the description below which will take you to my training website where there's a recording of the whole session as a workshop kind of session. If you're interested in this I'm running a online live training course uh, on test-driven development and the techniques which goes into considerably more depth than in this video uh, and check out that too. There are limited places still available. But for now, where do we begin with test-driven development? I'm often asked how to get started with uh, learning test-driven development and it's a, a tricky question in some ways uh, and but the answer is fairly simple. Um, practice. It's a skill that you learn. Nobody is skilled at this innately. Nobody comes to this fresh knowing precisely what to do. It's not that kind of thing. It's something that we learn how to do. The good news is that the skills are relatively simple to learn. The, hard, the more difficult news is that to get good at this sort of stuff is not really about tester and development it's about being good at design in many ways and that's the job of a lifetime to learn those kinds of skills um, in this episode i want to explore m my preferred way of starting and like lots of other people that teach tester and development i think the best place to start is with very simple exercises to practice and hone those skills. A kata in martial arts is a repeated exercise by which you kind of train your muscle memory to be able to repeat actions when you're fighting. Um, coding katas are similar. Uh, we adopt very simple exercises and we repeat them and repeat them over and over again, the same exercise over and over again so that we just use them as tools to hone our skills, to, to strengthen our, our approach. Now, in martial arts, where do you practice coding carters? You practice them usually in somewhere called a dojo, a training room. There's a, uh, there's a wonderful place in which you can practice these skills called Cyber Dojo, um, which is a charity which uh, donates all of its proceeds to helping children learn to program. So it's in a good cause. So if you do like what you see here today, go along to Cyber Dojo, check out their links and play with the tools. It's free. And if you like what you see, maybe make a donation and help some kids learn how to program. So here is Cyber Dojo. Uh, it's, uh, it's relatively straightforward. And what Cyber Dojo is, is a place to practice programming, specifically test driven development. I'm going to pick one of the really simpler ones here just to kind of demonstrate the tools, but also to demonstrate a little about how test driven development works and how to use Cyber Dojo to practice it. So we're going to choose FizzBuzz. 
This is the simple kids game. The idea is, is that for each number, you say the number, but if it's three or divisible by three, you say fizz, or if it's five or divisible by five, you say buzz. And if it's divisible by three and five, you say fizz buzz. That's the game. We're gonna write some code to make that work. And in the exercise here, it says write a program that prints the numbers from one to 100 for multiple, uh, blah, 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 the rules that I just said. Next, we can choose um, the technology that we'd like to exercise with. Um, so we could do this in assembler, uh, BCPL, bash, C, C sharp, C++, lots and lots and lots of different options, lots of options, a really excellent resource. And the lovely thing is, is that you don't need any configuration, any setup, any tools, you just need a web browser. You go to cyber-dojo.org, type that in and start working. So I'm, for today, I'm gonna to do some stuff in Python uh, and we'll choose the simple Python unit test version. The one that I'm gonna look at today is Solo. I'm working on my own. I'm gonna pick uh, uh, just, just to work on my own. Here, we've got a code and as long as we remember this, we can go back to that instance of the practice and we can recreate it and we can, we can go back and, and continue where we left off if we get interrupted somehow. Um, Cyber Dojo has got a lot of features built in. I'm not going to give you an ex exhaustive exploration. That's not the point of what I'm doing here today. My aim is to show you how to get started learning the skills of test room development and Cyber Dojo is a nice tool to do that. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate. One of the more recent features that I really like is that it asks, it gives you the option to predict the outcome of your next act. I'm gonna turn that on for today. But what you can do is that you can press test and every time you press test, it's gonna run any tests that you have written and give you a result. And it will give you a, 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 a pass, a fail, or a failure to compile uh, indication. And part of the game in Cyber Dojo is to try and tune that sequence of things. Good test room development is organized around the pattern of red, green refactor. And so what we would expect to see in perfect test room development is we're gonna write a test, we're gonna run it, we're gonna see it fail. And so we would expect that test to fail. So we're gonna get red. And in Cyber Dojo, we'll get a little red ball on the screen. Next, uh, we're going to write some code, just enough code to make the test pass. We're going to run the test again, see it pass. We're going to get a little green ball on the screen. And now we're going to refactor. We're going to look at the test and the code and see if there's anything that we'd like to do to tidy it up, make it more general while we're in the stable state of having a passing test. So we might get another green again, and we might get a series of different greens as we're refactoring to do that. So the good pattern is red, green, however many you want, red, green, however many you want, and so on. We'd like to try and avoid any yellows. We'd like to avoid too many reds in succession, but that's the kind of pattern that we're looking for in, in general, and Cyber Dojo will keep track of that. Um, the thing that you can do that I like, the feature that I started talking about and then didn't, is that we can predict each of those outcomes. One of my preferred approaches to test driven development, <coughs> excuse me, I'm just recovering from a cold. Um, one of my preferred uh, uh, patterns for test driven development is to um, predict any error message that I expect to see. At the point at which I write a test, I like to predict specifically what uh, what the outcome is going to be. I'll try and demonstrate that as we go through. So we're going to do FizzBuzz. And the interesting thing about FizzBuzz is there's kind of two parts to this, if you think about it. If you think about designing a solution for this, um, what a mistake that I see people commonly make is conflate the two parts. And I would try to avoid doing that. The two parts are we want to be able to iterate over a series of numbers and for each number, we want to be able to translate that into some displayable form. Um, perhaps uh, fizz, perhaps the number itself, perhaps buzz and so on. So I think I probably want to start with something that worries about iteration and something that worries about the translation of the numbers itself. 
I'd like to separate those two concerns in my design. I'm going to start with the second one because that's the meat of the problem and we'll come back to the first one. Now all cyber dojo uh, environments in which you carry out programming starts with um, these, uh, these, three, these few files here. So the first one is the README, that's what we're looking at right now, which is the description of the problem that we're trying to solve. Next is just a, a dummy template in the language that you're trying to use. So let's look at the, this one. And, uh, and they, they're not related to the problem that we're going to solve. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to, we're going to change these to be more suitable to what we want to do. And the place where we start in test driven development is with the test. So here's the test, and this is test hiker. Well, we're not testing hikers, so I'm going to rename that, and I can use this button here, and I can rename this to say test fizzbuzz. And we'll start from there. Uh, so um, we're probably going to have to change this as well because we're going to be taking fizzbuzz, not hiker. Um, I'm not interested in global answers, so I'm going to get rid of that. Um, probably going to have a class called fizzbuzz. Uh, I'm doing unit testing, and now here's the class itself, and I'd like to name that correctly. So fizzbuzz. Unit test case, I'm not interested in the global, so I'll delete that. This is kind of Python boilerplate that's often put in tests. So here's my first test, and I don't want to test an instant method. So what's the first test of Fizzbuzz? And when I'm doing test driven development, what I'm looking for as a starting point is what's the simplest starting point? Where, what's the easiest case that I can think of? And the easiest case in Fizzbuzz is I'm going to give it a number and it's just going to return the same number to me. Now, I do know part of the design, if I'm, because I'm thinking in terms of design now, the interface to my system, is that I'm going to need to be able to return a string at some point. So I'm going to start off by giving it a, a number, an integer, and I'm going to return a string version of that number. So um, test should return um, number for none, no, just say for integer. Okay, and we're going to assert equal, so let's start off, and the first number is number one. We, oh, let's choose number two. It's, I, I don't know why, but it's a mildly more interesting number. Okay, and then we're going to want something to do, to do the fizzbuzz thing, so let's call that fizzbuzz. So we've got a class called fizzbuzz and a method called fizzbuzz. That looks like my test. At the moment, if I were to run it, I'm going to get a compilation error. So that's no good. So I'm going to go now to the code and I'm going to do just enough work on the code to make this test compile and run and fail. Uh, and I want all of those things. I want it to compile. I want it to work well enough. I'm going to use the test to build a compilable version of starting point for my code. And then I'm going to do the simplest thing that I can to get the test to fail in a predictable way. So let's go to the hiker class. I'm going to remove all of this boilerplate because I'm not interested in that. Uh, we renamed the hiker class to be fizzbuzz. Um, and this method was called fizzbuzz. Uh, and the file itself should be called uh, fizzbuzz. Okay, so I've got a file called fizzbuzz with a class called fizzbuzz and a method called fizzbuzz. I haven't got a global answer, so what do I want to return? I'm going to return a string, and in this case, I'm going to return an empty string. That's the simplest string that I can return to make the code compile. Um, so my test, um, I should be able to create a class called fizzbuzz. Oh, I forgot to pass in a number. That was a mistake, and I didn't put that into the method here. So let's say number here. Um, that's now going to compile. That's going to work. So my test says we're going to call fizzbuzz with a number, and I'm giving it the wrong number, so that's stupid. I'm going to give it the correct number, um, and we expect to get back the string value of that number. So if I run this test now, I expect my test to run. Um, um, the code will compile okay, I think. Uh, but it's not going to work. It's going to say uh, an error message that says some, it's going to an empty string when it should have been two or something like that. So let's 
predict that my test is going to fail. I'm going to click on the red button here. CyberDojo is going to run the test for me. And yeah, my assertion error is it expected to, but was empty string. So that is the that is the failure that I expected. That's good. And I'll get my little red blob up here. And you can see there's a little tick next to it saying that my prediction was accurate. So the test still looks okay. So let's make that test pass now. So given a number, uh, we want to return the string value of that number. And that's going to be something like this. And now I expect if I run this, that this is going to pass. So let's click green. Bingo, there's my first passing test. So we're underway now. We've started test doing development. We've got the sketch of our system. Uh, and we've kind of done some design thinking about how we're going to organize our code to be able to um, uh, do this. So what's our next test? What's the next interesting case that we could think of? Well, the next really interesting thing. So that's going to work for all of the in integers. So the next interesting case, so it should return fizz for three. Now, one of the things that I would bring to your attention is that I'm making progress here in very small steps. And that's completely intentional. Um, I don't want to take too big a leap. So we know that the ultimate goal for what we're trying to achieve is that we'd like to be able to create return fizz, for example, for multiples of three. But I don't want to go there straight away. I want to consciously do this in small steps. That's going to give me more opportunities to reflect on and, and refine my design. It's going to make the testing itself simpler and more obvious at each stage. I don't have to be brilliant to think of the, the wonderful, perfect test. I can just think of the smallest step. And it's going to mean that my distance from safety at every point along the way is short. It's small. I'm never very far from something that was working. Um, so, uh, fizz, uh, let me just finish off typing this, fizzbuzz3, and close the brackets. So, I think that's enough. That looks like it's correct. So, I think that if I run this test, this test should fail, and it's going to fail. What's it going to do? Um, it's going to give three, and it's going to return three as a string at the moment, because that's all it does. So it's expected fizz, but got three. Yes, here's my assertion error, expected fizz, but got three. So let's go and have a look and let's modify the code. And my intent now, we are now in an unstable state. Uh, my code is failing tests. And so my intention now is to um, find the shortest route back to stability, back to having a test that passes and, and does what we want it to do. So I'm not going to spend too much time agonizing now over what beautiful code looks like here. I'm just going to write something simple that's going to work. So if number equals three, return fizz. That should be enough, I think. So let's, I think that test should pass. So let's say it's green and let's predict that this is going to pass. And it does indeed pass. So notice it's run, run both of my tests so far. CyberDojo does that all the time. It'll run all of the tests that you're working on uh, uh, on each time that you, you press one of these buttons to evaluate. So my tests are passing. So now the process is red, green, refactor. So let's have a look at refactoring. Is there anything here in my test that I think I could do better? Would I like to tidy this up a bit? Um, not really. I think that's fairly expressive. You can argue about whether this, these lines are a bit jumbled. There's a lot going on because everything that's going on in the test is going on in these, these lines, but it's a very simple test. So I think that's nice and readable. Um, this there's something about this I don't like very much. One of my rules of thumb, my, my guiding principles, is I don't very much like having multiple return paths from a, from a function. 
Um, and you can certainly, I, I, you know, it, it, at this stage, if I to, if I were to introduce a variable to come, hold the return value, which I'm very tempted to do, um, that's probably going to be more code, and you could argue whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. For a, a function like this of three lines, I'm not going to argue too much that there are multiple return paths. But you get a function of even 10 or 15 lines, I think it's really bad to have multiple exit points from that function. I think it's much more readable, much you get, gain much greater clarity. You've got a single exit point for each function uh, in, in, this, in, this, uh, in, in this context. Or, sorry, a, a single return value at least for each function. Uh, and so I, I would be tempted to change that, but I'm not going to do it right now. But I've thought about it. I've thought about what 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 would make my design better, and it's now in the back of my mind. Um, what's next? The next obvious thing to do now is to deal with fives. There's my test. Clearly, this isn't going to work. It's not going to pass. Um, so what's the error message? What do you predict the error message will be here? Uh, oh, I think it's fairly obvious is that what we're going to get, it's not a three, so we're not going to get fizz. Uh, we're going to get a five as a string, a numeric five as a string. That's not what we want. So the error message is going to say something like buzz is not equal to five. Or So we're going to expect it to fail. Let's press the red button. Oh, I've got a compilation error. Now you can see I've made a mistake. I've done something stupid in writing my code. And I've got a compilation error here. Uh, so my prediction was wrong. What did I do? Fizzbiz is not defined. I've got a typo in my test. Fizzbiz. Ah, there we go. So let's correct that and let's try again. So that's a bad mark for me in terms of being able to make progress. But there you go. So now I think it's, let's just double check. Fizzbuzz, fizzbuzz. Let's look at the solution. That hasn't changed. So yeah, I think it's going to fail now with the error that I predicted last time buzz is not equal to five and that's what we get good so we're back on path with um a a, a red ball um our objective here is to try and work in such small steps that we are even if we do make a mistake it's going to be a bit like that it's going to be trivial and simple to understand and reflect on we're going to work in tiny little steps, evaluate our progress after each step, predicting either a pass or a failing test. And if we get a compilation error like this, it's going to be easy to spot if we haven't done too much work. One of the big anti-patterns to spot that CyberDojo will highlight for you with lots of little yellow balls is where you do that kind of thing where you do too much work, you wander off, you make you do something, it doesn't compile properly, and then you, you, you get four or five different compiler errors in a row while you're trying to figure out and get it back to a working state. There's tools in CyberDojo that can help you get back. You can, there's a version control system built in, but, but ignoring that for now. The objective is to get Red, green, red, green, red, green, red, green, and not have any yellow, little yellow balls. So when you do get a little yellow ball, it's going to be really easy to fix. Lots of small steps is the secret here. At that point, I think it's worth us wrapping up. If you're interested in seeing more of this, please do let me know in the comments be below, and I may publish the second half uh, here on, on YouTube. If you'd just like to see the unedited version of the whole exercise, uh, that's available on my training website, courses.cd.training. Uh, thank you very much for watching.